encourage you to love God with everything that you have and are. That you would live recklessly for the Lord by faith in him. That you would know Jesus Christ not just as a person but as your Savior. And that Jesus would not be an idea but that he would be real. That that you would know him. That you would worship him. That you would love him. And that you would have peace with the Father and you would love the Father the way you love the Son. And that you might know the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. Those are things that I pray for us. And if you don't know Christ, my prayer is is that you would know him. And then in the middle of all of this, I realize that on Sunday mornings, there are people here who uh, are struggling with God. That you have real fears, real doubts. Uh, real insecurities. We live in a very real world where there's a lot of pain and a lot of sin and a lot of struggles. And um, and so I pray for I pray for you that somehow in the middle of all of these things that's going on in your life, that your greatest comfort would be the gospel. And so um, I hope you come here with a sense that Sean, you've got some good news for me because this week's been a rough week and. Um, And the gospel literally means good news. And I don't think there is a greater news that we could hear, no matter what's going on with our finances, with our marriage, with our kids, with our job, with anything, than the gospel of Jesus Christ. And one of the ways that that was communicated to me was uh, through reading a book called um, Helping When It Hurts. And there was a, a pastor that went to go visit another pastor down in Mexico City, and they went to a dump on Sunday morning. And the, in Mexico City, it's a very large city, and, and at the dump, there's a lot of homeless people that are rummaging for food through the, the garbage that's there. And, and he went, and he, he had compassion on, the pastor went to see people in the situation that had compassion on the people that were finding their food in the dump. But what blew him away was there, on the side, he heard people singing, and he said, what's that about? And he said, oh, that's what we came here for. That's the church service that I want you to see this morning. And on the back side of this dump were people that were homeless, that were penniless, that were gathering, and they were praising God. And he said, I want my church to know Jesus the way those people know Jesus. That they have nothing, and they worship him, and they sit, and they listen to the word of God in such a way that it is more nutritional for them than the food that is in the heap behind them, that they, they long for those words. And I think, man, if we could, we, we live in a, a place where the gospel is so um, lost sometimes because of the busyness. That's, that's how I pray. I want us to know Jesus like that. So if you've never been to church this morning, you're coming in and, you're, and, you, and you see us singing and you go, what's that about? I remember when I first went to church, I go, why do, why do they sing? I don't know any of those songs, and everyone here seems to. Let me just share with you what worship is. Worship prepares our hearts, and singing is one of those things. Some people don't get music. I love music, um, so I really enjoy worship, but some people don't, and that's fine. That's okay, but worship is a thing that prepares our hearts for the reading of the Word. We, we, We align ourselves vertically so that we can hear from Him. So I just want you to know, if you're here this morning and you go, what's the singing all about? It's just a way for us to prepare our hearts. So here's our passage, Ephesians 4 and 5, two verses, and then 1 Timothy 1.15. Uh, here's some points uh, that I want you to know. In 1 Timothy 1.15, I want you to know that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's, that's like, if, if we want to know what Chris, Christmas is all about... Christmas is God's answer to sin's problem. So so Christmas has a very clear salvation message. The whole reason that Jesus came into the world was to save sinners. Um, And then when we look at Ephesians 4 and 5, we see that God being rich in mercy. So the thing I want us to see here is that God is rich in mercy because of the great love with which he has loved us, that God is love. 
and his love is right and true and correct. He is the author of love, the definer of love, and our world today has twisted what love is. And if we want to align ourselves with God and we want to worship him and we want to live in a right relationship with him and other people, then we have to love in a way in which he loves us. The other thing is, is we were dead in our trespasses, but God made us alive together with Christ. And that is what grace is. That's the grace that is here, is that we were made alive together with Christ. You were spiritually dead, and we'll get into that, and you might be sitting there going, Sean, you're talking weird nonsense stuff. Is of God, by God, for God, through God, to God, and my prayer is that it wouldn't be nonsense by the end of it all. So, I want us to know what is the reason for this season? Jesus was born for the purpose of redeeming lost and sinful people. And last week, as we looked at Ephesians, let me just share with you, we looked at the reality that we, are, we have a sin problem. Uh, we were dead in our trespasses and sins, that's Ephesians 2.1. In which we once walked, we were following the course of this world. We weren't following God. We were finding our identity and purpose and meaning in this world, which is fallen and sinful. We were following the prince of the power of the air. That is, we were following the father of all lies, who is the devil himself. This is what we once were. And maybe some of you are. Uh, we were following the spirit that is at work in the sons of disobedience. We were just deliberately, intentionally, and ignorantly doing the wrong thing. And then verse four, but God. Everyone is born with a natural bent away from God, and everyone is in need of a savior. And so as we prepare our hearts and minds for Christmas, let us remember what Christmas really is. Christmas is God's answer to humanity's sin problem. I'm gonna say that again and again and again because I don't want you to think that Christmas is about a big fat man in a red suit giving out presents. Christmas is God's answer to humanity's sin problem. In Luke chapter two is the story of Jesus' birth and in verse 11 we hear the message from the angels for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. There's three titles that, is, that are there, Savior, Christ, and Lord. Savior literally means deliverer. He would deliver us from bondage. Christ means the anointed one or the Messiah. If you've ever read the Old Testament, I know it's a lot of books in there, but if you've ever read it, you would come to the end and you would say, where's the Messiah? Like it's, it's missing something key. Like it's, 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 it's building up to a place and you go, where's the Messiah? Well, that's the New Testament. So Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one, or the long-awaited Messiah. It's all the same thing in the title Christ. And the last thing there is Lord, which means supreme authority. So we have three titles. He's our Savior, He is the anointed one, and He is the Lord. He is our Savior. The problem was that the Jews thought that their salvation was a political salvation. Because if you know anything about history, Rome was this place that was large. Most of us know about the Roman Empire. Well, they controlled Jerusalem, and the Jews were under the political oppression of Rome. They were giving taxes to Rome. And they didn't like that. They wanted to be number one. So the reality was is Jesus did not come to deliver people from political oppression or government oppression. I know there's some people who look at our world today and, and we want political relief. We want government relief. Jesus didn't come for that. Jesus came to deliver people personally because every person is under the authority of the prince of the devil the prince who is the devil of this world. They are under the influence of the devil's lies and schemes, and they're held captive to sin. Jesus said this, truly, truly, I say to you. When he says it re redundantly like that, when he says truly, truly, that's like, this is a real thing. Like, like, that's just, 
Don't make me repeat myself. That's, that's like truly, truly. Like this is really, 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 really a problem. Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Like you just, you just keep doing it over and over. You don't want to, but you keep doing it. Second Peter 2.19 this is Peter speaking, the disciple of Jesus who preached the first sermon at Pentecost. He says, for whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. You see, there are people here who are enslaved to sin. And we look at our world today, and you were talking, Melody, about our world today, and we live in a world that is enslaved to sin. I mean, sexual promiscuity is rampant. Um, Pornography is rampant. We're, we're confused as to what is a boy and what is a girl. What is a healthy relationship? What is, what is, we're redefining truth. Drugs, alcohol, prescription medication, these are all addictions. People are enslaved to these things. Debt, work. There's some people, you know, some people have money, but they never have money enough. And so they're just a slave to work, and they become a workaholic. Or they're so in debt that they ha they're a slave to work because they're a slave to the lender. Some people lie without ceasing. And you, you're just you're like, I don't know why I lie. I, I mean, I was a liar. I told people dumb things. Like, yeah, I went to the moon. <laughs> no, you didn't. But I'd be so dumb, and I'd say it, and I'd think that the best way to, the best way to get out of a lie is to tell another lie. And, and then... I was just, there's some people here who know that. There's some people here who are addicted to hate. You just hate the other side. And you find your purpose and meaning and your joy in conversations being with like minded people who hate the same things that you hate. I remember one time there was a gal I worked with, her name was Judy, and we had nothing in common. And, and, and I was thinking, how, how can I build a friendship with Judy? And I was at the post office, and I got stuck in line forever, and I came back to the, to the office, and I was complaining about the post office, and all of a sudden, Judy and I became friends. <laughs> and our friendship was centered around something that we both hated. That's not a healthy friendship. We live in a world that is identified by sin, and we become enslaved to that thing, and we just, um, we, we, it's wrong. Jesus came to deliver us from personal bondage. So let's look at Ephesians 2 through the lens of Christmas and the significance of the incarnation. I just gave you a big theological word and some of you might think incarnation, is that a milk? Like words have meaning, so let me just define that. The word incarnation is the act where the second person of the Godhead, who is that? Jesus, okay? Some of you are saying Godhead. Okay. There's the Father, there is the Son, and there is the Holy Spirit. So the incarnation is where Jesus, who is fully God, he is the eternal Son of God. There has never been a point in eternity where the Son was not the Son. He is the eternal Son of God, he took on flesh. He didn't always have flesh. Jesus wasn't always a man. He didn't always have two arms, two legs, two eyes, a nose, and a mouth, ten fingers, and ten toes. God was spirit. The Old Testament says God was spirit. But Jesus took on flesh, and he left his throne. This is called the incarnation. It means that Jesus had both a divine nature and a human nature. He was truly God, and he was truly man. So let's look at Ephesians 2 through that context. So verse 4 says, But God being rich in mercy. Mercy is an attribute of the Godhead, meaning that mercy is an attribute of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Rich in mercy means more wealth than you could imagine. And you might be sitting there going, I can imagine a lot. Well, it's more. It's more than you can imagine. Mercy is often misunderstood as grace. It's similar, but it's not the same. I want us to know that mercy is the servant to grace's glory. 
Let me say that again. And I will say it again and again. Mercy is the servant to grace his glory. So let's just define mercy this morning. Because I'm telling you these things not so we can win at Bible trivia, but that we might love Jesus more. Mercy is compassionate or kindly forbearance shown towards an offender or an enemy. It involves compassion, pity, or benevolence. Why did God show us mercy? I want you to know, we look at the verse, go back, look at your Bible. Why did he show us mercy? Because of the great love with which he loved us. Mercy is an aspect of God's love. It is a legal term. And it involves acts like being pardoned, being forgiven, or not having to deal with the legal consequences. Mercy is when Jesus took the wrath that we deserve. It's a legal term. It's a term that applies to authority or the one who is wrong. Let me explain this. Uh, so, I don't know, if you're an only child, you might not get this, but if you have siblings, you will. So, if your brother or sister punches you hard, okay, now, you can receive mercy from the one who punched you. Or the, 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 one who was, the one who was punched can give mercy to the one who punched him. Like, you know what? I'm going to let this one slide. I'm going to turn my cheek on this one. Next time, I'm going to plow your field. <laughs> okay. So they can give me mercy, turn the other cheek, or they can get mad at me, and I could run to mom because I punched my sibling, Mom, 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 he's going to get back at me because I punched him. Or dad. Now, the authority can give mercy. Now, let me share something about mercy. This is the way it works. It doesn't seem fair, but remember what mercy is. So the mom or the dad can say to the son who was punched, you need to forgive him, and nothing's going to happen this time. Let's just move on. Now, the one who was punched might go, that's not fair. Spank them. Get a wooden spoon. Get something. Ground them. Take the phone away. Make them understand that this isn't right. Make them change their way. But if they did that, that wouldn't be mercy. So mercy can be given from two people, the one who was wronged or an authority. In this case, it's the father who gives us mercy. Now, we might see somebody who has wronged us, and they give their life to Christ, and you go, that's not real. That's not good. It is. Mercy can be given from authority. So, it's a legal term. It doesn't seem fair, but remember that mercy is compassionate or friendly forbearance shown towards an offender or an enemy. That's why we see people say, I throw myself at the mercy of the court. God knows that you and I are incapable of rescuing ourselves from our sinful choices, and he took pity on us. Praise God he took pity on us. He had compassion on us. Because we were helpless. There's nothing that we can do. We can't fix our sin problem. I just shared with you that my answer to solving lying was to tell more lies. Because nothing gets you out of lying like telling more lies. We perpetuate the problem. We have a sin problem. We're held captive to it. God took compassion on us. Because we were in bondage to sin. You know, some people ask the question, how could an all-loving God sentence people to hell? Let me ask a better question. What kind of God would send his only son to take the wrath that we deserve so that we don't have to go to hell? That's a better question. The answer is, a God of love who is rich in mercy would send his only son to live a perfect, sinless life, to receive the wrath that we deserve so that we might receive something we could never get on our own, the righteousness of Christ. Mercy, again, is the reality that Jesus bore our sins on himself and received the wrath of the Father. 
He's rich in mercy. He took all of the wrath. That's what that means. The wrath of God is satisfied. And I'm waiting for someone to say hallelujah. hallelujah. The wrath of God is satisfied. He is rich in mercy. Remember, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. The Christmas story is the story of God's answer to our sin problem. It is a story of God's mercy and his love that caused the Father to send his one and only Son, that whoever should believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. God's love and mercy for us is not based on what he sees inside of us. It is based on what is inside of him. So God doesn't see us in our helpless state and say, you know, there's a lot of potential in that one. I'll save that one. Not so much potential in that one. I won't save that one. God doesn't look at our potential. God doesn't look at what's inside of us. He saves us based on what's inside of him. Our world today equates love with acceptance. But that is not what biblical or godly love is. It's not even based on what real love is. Let me just share with you. Love is not based on acceptance. It's based on what is true. And what is true is that God hates sin. I know we, we live in a world where we, we see banners around, all you need is love. Romans 12 tells us, let love be true or sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. And because God truly loved us, he knew the reality of our sin. And God hates sin. It was his hatred of our sin and his love for us that caused him to send his son. To leave heaven, to take on flesh. It's amazing to think that the whole purpose that that baby was there was to die in our place. When Jesus stood before Pontius Pilate, he said, for this reason I came into the world. He came into the world to die. There was a, if you read the Gospel of John, you will see that Jesus was a conductor of time. There was a miracle. His first miracle was a wedding and his mother said, uh, Jesus, you can go do this. And he said, my time has not yet come. Why do you want me to do this? Time and again, Jesus says, my time has not yet come. My time has not yet come. My time has not yet come. All he's saying there is I have a reason for coming. I have a reason for being here. I left the Father for a reason. And then when it was the appointed time, he said, the hour has come. He came for a reason to die for our sins. He loved us so much that he had to deal with our sins. So let me just share with you something about your relationships that you have with your kids and your spouse. If you really want to have a godly love towards one another, it must be based on what is real and what is true. Which means that we have to confess our sins to one another so we can love one another. We'll know the mercy of God when we let people know who we really are, husbands, let your wives know what your challenges are. Wives, let your husband know what your challenges are. Let truth be truth. Kids, let your parents know what your challenges are. We live in a world where we mask a lot of things and we hide a lot of things and we say we love one another. Love is not based on acceptance. Love is dealing with truth. Jesus dealt with truth in our life by sending his son to pour, pour out his wrath on his son that we might receive mercy. So when we're honest and we let people know what's going on in our life, then they can truly love us and we can receive mercy and we know the mercy of God is real. Let me share, when we, when we are merciful to our wife and our kids, we convey to our spouse and our kids that God's mercy is real and true. I have met too many Christian families that have called themselves Christians, but yet they don't live as if the gospel's real. Here's another truth about Christmas. This is an important truth because it deals with the gospel. Jesus was born of a virgin. I have heard people say that that's not an essential truth to believe in, that it's not necessarily orthodox or orthodoxy. Let me share with you, it is a fundamental truth that we have to believe in. 
To remove the virgin birth is to undo his purpose in coming. It undoes mercy and grace. It's not a reflection accurately of his love. So uh, Dr. Kevin DeYoung, uh, who was a pastor, now he's teaching at a seminary to train pastors. This is what he writes. He says two things. He says, first, the virgin birth demonstrates that Jesus was truly human and truly divine. If Jesus had not been born of a human, he could not, we could not believe in his full humanity. But if his birth were like any other human birth through the union of a husband and wife or mother and father, we would question his full divinity. The virgin birth is necessary to secure both a real human nature and a completely divine nature. That's the first reason. Here's the second reason. The virgin birth is essential because it means Jesus did not inherit the curse of depravity that clings to Adam's race. Jesus was made like us in every way except for sin. Every human father begets a son or daughter with a sin nature. So moms, if you want to know why your kids act the way they do, it's your husband's fault. We may not understand completely how this works, but this is the way of the real world after the fall. Sinners beget sinners, always. So if Joseph was the real father of Jesus or Mary had been sleeping around with Larry, Jesus was not spotless nor innocent. He was not perfect and he was not holy. And as a result, we have no mediator, no imputation of Christ's righteousness, because he has no righteousness to impute on us and no salvation, and Jesus would have died for his own sins. So the virgin birth is necessary. I want us to understand that. It's a key thing. Remember, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and the Christmas story is God's answer to our sin problems. So if someone says the virgin birth isn't necessary, walk away. Just walk away. That's a conversation you don't need. Remember Ecclesiastes, if you were here, we went through the passage in Ecclesiastes 1, you can't fix stupid. So if someone says that, just walk away. You're not going to be the solution to it. No one, by the way, no one comes to a sane way of thinking through losing an argument. So don't engage in argument. God the Father in his love for us sent his son to be born of a virgin, to live a perfect sinless life, to die on the cross in our place. And in doing so, he displays his love and his mercy. So here's where we get to the definition of grace. Look at verse 5. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, we were made alive together with Christ. That's grace. That's not mercy, that's grace. Remember, mercy is the servant to grace's glory. Mercy is when we do not get what we do not deserve. The wrath of God, eternal damnation, eternal suffering. So let's define grace. Grace combines the notion of love and loyalty that is displayed in concrete acts for the benefit of God's people without merit or earned favor. So let me say that again. Grace combines the notions of love and loyalty that is displayed in concrete acts for the benefit of God's people without merit or earned favor. So what is the concrete act here? We were made alive with Christ. That's grace. You were dead, now you're alive. That's grace. That's not mercy. God's love made you alive with Christ, and God's loyalty will keep you alive with Christ. So your spiritual birth had nothing to do with you and everything to do with God. Let me share with you, we were dead in our sins. How many times have you seen a corpse in a hospital grab the defibrillator and hit himself? (laughs) It's impossible. Dead people can't do that. So Spiritual death to spiritual life has to be of God because dead people can't make themselves alive. And we were spiritually dead and we needed God to do that. That's grace. Salvation and the fullness of salvation is God's grace. 
In Ephesians 1, there's a doxology, a praising of what God has done for us. These are things that God did for us that were all grace. We didn't earn it and we don't deserve it. What were those things? Well, he made us holy and blameless. He predestined us. He adopted us as sons. That's significant. We have redemption through his blood. We have forgiveness of our trespasses. He made known to us the mystery of his will. God didn't have to do that, but he did. He sealed us with the Holy Spirit. These are all things of grace. And we have salvation. And the fullness of salvation, every aspect of salvation is of grace. There's some things that Scripture says for those who are saved. We're a royal priesthood. We're a holy nation. We're a child of God. By our own merit, we could never earn these things. Because of the real meaning of Christmas, we get to experience the mercy of God, the grace of God, and the love of God, all because Jesus humbled himself, left the Father, took on flesh, experienced every facet of our human life, was tempted in every way, and yet was without sin, and died on the cross, was buried, and rose again. Because of that, we have grace. Look at the last part of the verse here. We're going to end really early this week, and you're fine with that. There's no Sunday school. We're going, to, we're going to be out of here early. I'm on the last part. Not like last week when I said there's 30 seconds left and I went seven minutes. <laughs> we're, we're truly at the end of it here. I'm, I'm, I'm at the end. I'm at the end of my... You are... By grace, you have been saved. <laughs> Dismissed. No. Not, not, not yet. Not yet. You know me better than that. That word saved... It's such a beautiful word, saved. I mean, you are saved. Amen. It means you're protected. Sozo, that's the Greek word. You're protected by God. Your salvation is protected by God. You are, it, it, you are made right with God. That's what it is to be saved. This word is vast in its meaning, and, and I think the whole definition of saved is, uh, is good to be understood by us. We're made whole. We're made right. We were broken, and he's put it. It's, if you've ever had a rib out or a back out, and you go to the chiropractor, and he puts you in place, and you go, ah. That's salvation for your back, but there's a salvation for your soul that Jesus gives where he makes it right. We had a natural bent towards sin, and God delivers us, and he makes us right. There's a sense of healing in there, and we're safe. I mean, I don't know if you've ever been in a place where you've been in danger, and then you've been safe. My neighbor, uh, Jason Ingram next to us had a dog that was half dingo, half pit bull. And I, if I cut through his property, it saved me a mile. But they had their dog. And I knew I was safe if I could hop the fence. <laughs> but I was sweating bullets to get to that fence. And I know that feeling on the other side going, Whew. When I received Christ, I didn't know what had happened, but I knew something was different. And there was a, there was a, I'm okay, I'm okay. Like I know my life is one big train wreck, but I know that no matter what happens, because right now going forward, God is with me, I'll be okay. And that's what, I mean, God is with you. That's what Emmanuel means, God with us. And there is a sense that no matter what you're going through, God is with you. And no matter what you're going through, as long as God is going through it with you, you know you're okay. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but you know that God is with you and you are safe. You're not alone. He will never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He'll never abandon you. No matter what you're going through, no matter how hard it is, no matter how painful it is, you're not alone. You're safe. You're right where God wants you to be because he's with you. I just did a funeral yesterday for a gal who 
died of cancer. And she knew, she knew Jesus and she told her son, I'm ready. I'm not afraid. I'm ready. I'm ready to go. I know where I'm going. How does she, how does she have that peace? How can she be ready? Because she was saved. You know, it's appointed once for man to die and after that face judgment. So I shared with everybody yesterday, don't let your hearts be troubled. It's okay to grieve, but our hearts aren't troubled because when someone is saved, we know where they're going, we know where they're at, we know where their hope is. And Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to prepare a room. And if he breathed creation into existence in six days, I can only imagine how awesome the place that he's been building for the last 2,000 years is. I mean, it's going to be wonderful. It's going to be glorious. And there is a peace that comes from that. How does she have that? She's saved. For those of us in Christ, there's no fear because of Jesus. Because we've received him as our king. We've bent our knee and called him Lord, and we worship him, and we love him, and we're saved, and we have peace. But for those who have rejected Christ, there's a reality that you are unsaved. Let me just share with you you're not protected. You're walking through life stepping on landmines no matter where you go. Your life is messed up. Your life is just one broken relationship after another. And you feel broken. You want to do the right thing, but you can't. You're powerless. And you know that if you die, you're fully worthy of going to hell. You know, people say, If I go to hell, all my friends will be there. Let me just share with you, that's a lie. The definition of hell is to to not be in the presence of God. It's to be alone. Jesus says, eternity of weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's eternal suffering. It's eternal torment because you're fully worthy of it. You've pursued yourself. You've rejected Christ. You've rejected God. Hell is not a party with all your friends. Scripture defines it in a pretty ugly way. I'm telling you, if I had to choose, where would I rather be, saved or unsaved? It's a no-brainer. And maybe you're here this morning and maybe you're not saved. Maybe you don't have peace. Maybe, maybe I just defined you. I want you to know that you're here for a reason. You're here because this morning you can have salvation if you put your hope and faith in Jesus Christ. And after the service, I'm gonna have a couple people up here and if you would like to, to know about how you can be saved, how you can have peace with God, I'm gonna have Brian Katz come up here after the worship or during the worship. I'm gonna have Tom come up here and I'm gonna have Ronnie Sue come up here. So Ron, if you're a gal, go to Ronnie Sue. And if you're a guy, we've got a couple guys up here, but I want you to know that you can have peace with God today. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. The Christmas story is a gospel story.